Hey, I'm Pastor Barry Absher. I want to thank you guys for liking and subscribing to our channel. All the feedback that we've received has been such a blessing. If you've not subscribed to our channel, I wanted to take this time to personally ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're really excited about what God is doing here at City on a Hill. And we're also excited about what God is doing in your life and in our lives together. Let's be part of the internet family. Let's link up. Let's join. Continue to watch our videos. Like, subscribe. Let's get on the train together and see what happens. God bless you so much. Bye-bye. chapter 6 verse 4 and they brought it out of his out of the house of Abinadad which was at Gibeah accompanying the ark of God and Ohio went before the ark and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood even on harps and psalteries and timbrels and the coronets and the cymbals and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and he took hold of it for the oxen shook it and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error and there he died in the ark of the covenant of God and David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah unto this day and David was afraid of the Lord that day and said how shall the ark of the Lord come to me so David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Now I want him to put up Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And again he entered into Capernaum, and it was noised that he was in the house. I want to preach a little while this morning of the subject of when Jesus is in the house. When Jesus is in the house, would you stretch forth your hands and pray for me? Spirit of the living God, overtake me, captivate me. God, I ask you to use me as an instrument for your glory and your glory alone. I believe there are people here today that desperately need what I believe you've told me to say, what I believe you're anointing me to say. I can't say it without you. And so, God, I ask you to go before me, prepare the hearts, the minds, and the ears of the hearer that they may hear your word. God, and just from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, set me aflame today with your word and your glory, and let no one leave like they came in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Give the Lord one more hand clap of praise, and you may be seated. When Jesus gets in the house, things change. One of the marks of Jesus is he never left the scene the same way he found it. The same way when Jesus finds you in a broken condition, in an addicted condition, in a hurting condition, I promise you Jesus may find you that way, but he won't leave you that way. Many of you, I look out in this audience today and I can remember where you were when God found you. Many of you were in a desperate place. Many of you were in a dry place. But when God got a hold of you, he pulled you out. David said it this way, he lifted me out of the miry clay. What I love about Jesus is Jesus had the ability not to be changed by the situation, but the anointing on his life was to change the situation. You and I live in a time where so many people are changed by the situation when God did not call us to be changed by the pressure, but God anointed us to change the pressure. God, yes, go ahead and give him a praise because we're going to praise God hopefully a lot during this message today. When God, God is not a thermost, a thermometer, God is like a thermostat. He changes the atmosphere. 
He can come to somebody that's in a broke down low place and he can lift them up. Somebody that's committed atrocious sins and, and went through things that you can't even imagine or talk about behind the pulpit. And once Jesus gets in their lives, things begin to change. He can take a drug addict and turn them into a preacher. He can take somebody that's been caught in perversion and turn them into a man or woman of God. Jesus knows no limit. If you let Jesus in, he going to drive the devils out. I said, if you let Jesus in... Just ask the manic of the Gadarenes who was in a bad situation. But when Jesus got there, things began to change. I truly believe that there are people under the sound of my voice today that Jesus is longing to get in your house. Jesus is longing to get in this house this morning. When Jesus gets in a church, what did he say? Where two or three are gathered in my name, he said, I will be there in the midst of them. And when the presence of God invades a service, conviction begins to grab the heart of the sinner. Have you ever been? I'll never forget one time I walked into church, a stone cold sinner. And there wasn't nobody preaching, but they were singing. And I felt that otherworldly presence. I felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost, Pastor Bobby. And it drew me to the altar before the preacher ever got there. I longed for the days. I loved it when these worshipers came up here without anybody having to ask them. They just had a whole bunch of can't help it on them. They couldn't help but give God glory. They couldn't help but give God praise. Have I got anybody that just can't help it this morning? He's been too good to you. He's been too awesome to you. Somebody just say, I can't help it. Every now and then I get the can't help it's on me. I can't help but give him a shout. I can't help but give him a praise. When I think about all that God has done for me, when I think about all that God has brought me through, and when I think about some of the services, Chelsea, that I've been in, services like you've set the atmosphere, atmosphere for today, I think about how God got a hold of me in church and changed my life. David knew what he was talking about when he said, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. David realized that one encounter with God in his house could change a lifetime of bad decisions. If you believe that, give the Lord a head clap of praise right now. I don't care how you messed up and how many times you messed up. If you let the presence of God do what he wants to do in this service today, you're going to leave changed. You're going to leave blessed. You're going to leave different than you came. In the old covenant, if you entered the temple through the east gate, you had to leave through the west gate. If you entered through the south gate, you had to leave through the north gate. That was God saying, you are not allowed to leave my presence like you came. Some of you might have come depressed. You're going to leave blessed. Some of you might have come broken. You're going to leave healed. Some of you might have come nervous. You're going to leave with a peace that passes all understanding. I'm trying to find my audience in here right now. Is there anybody that needs the presence of God to invade this service? When you let God in the house, things change. When you let God in the house, things begin to shift and things begin to move and demons begin to tremble. And do you find out in, in the Bible, in the old covenant, the ark was a type and a shadow of Jesus. And it was anointed. Everybody say anointed. Anointed means set apart. Anoint, any anointed thing in your life, it's there to bless you. It's there to make your life better. I know it sounds old-fashioned. I know a lot of people, uh, I've been in theological classes back when I had to take cemetery. I mean seminary. I went to a few Bible classes, and they got on my nerves because, because the preacher said, uh, ain't nothing special about the book, just the book. The preacher said that. I believe there is something special about this book. As soon as he said that, I checked out. I thought, I can't believe you're up here and you're degrading the Word of God. I believe that the Word of God is holy. I believe it's sacred. I believe it's able to put your life back together. I believe it's able to calm a troubled mind. I believe church is holy, anointed, set apart, and sacred. 
I believe that God puts people in your life that are anointed, set apart, and sacred, and they are there to bless you. And there are some things in your life that God says, if you want them to keep blessing you, don't touch them. That don't mean don't hug them. That don't mean don't be good to them. The Bible said to touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. And the reason a lot of people can't get anything out of church today is they have touched the anointed things of God. They have made fun of the anointed things of God. They no longer reverence the anointed things of God. And therefore, when they get in trouble, they, what you honor, you draw to you. What you dishonor, you push away from you. I want to honor God so that he comes. I want everybody to stand to your feet and give the anointed one a praise of glory let his spirit flood this building in the name of Jesus in the mighty name of Jesus somebody just say Jesus God will send people in your life that are anointed to help you now the devil don't like that the devil don't like you having people in your life that God has sent because when God wants to bless you he sends a person. When the devil wants to wreck you, he sends a person. And it becomes your job to walk in the spirit of discernment and say, is that person sent by God? Or has that person been sent by the devil? Pastor Bobby, would you come stand up and, and come up here for a second? Pastor Bobby is somebody that God has used in my life. Even before we were saved, Bobby was my buddy. Bobby was my pal. Bobby was my friend. But Bobby, God has put stuff in Pastor Bobby that blesses other people. God has put stuff in Pastor Bobby that has blessed me time and time again. One night I was going through a bad time, a bad time a few years ago. Carlene called Bobby and she said, you got to come to the house right now. Bobby came to the house and by the time he was done talking to me, I slept like a baby because of the anointing that God placed inside of him. Now, I'm saying that to say this. The devil would love for me not to be able to receive from what God put in Bobby. The devil would love for something to touch Bobby, for something to shove Bobby out of position to where Bobby wasn't doing what God called Bobby to do. The devil, that's why gossip is of the devil. That's why rumors are of the devil, because they will keep you from receiving from the very people God has sent in your life to set you free. Thank you, Pastor Bobby. There are some people that don't believe in women preachers. I get a kick out of those people. I can take you through the Bible and prove to you how God used women. It is all through the Old Covenant, all through the New Covenant. God loves his daughters just as much as he loves his sons. Let all the daughters give him a praise right now. But there are some people in the community that if I were to stand summer up here, she's got the anointing on the inside of her and the word of the Lord in her mouth to, to help them be set free. But because the tradition of men has taught her that women can't preach, they would not be able to receive what God has placed in her. Because the Bible says the traditions of men make the word of God of none effect. That's what your Bible says. So if there's one thing stronger than the Word of God, and y'all give me some liberty on this, it's the traditions of man. The traditions of man will keep you from receiving the Spirit of God. I don't want any man-made tradition to keep me from the fullness that God has placed in His book and in His Spirit. If it ain't in the Bible, I don't want none of it. But if God's got it for me, bring it on down. Bring it on down. Lord, let your Holy Ghost come on down. Somebody say, He's coming down. He's coming down, he's coming up, he's coming out. The Spirit of God wants to move in this place this morning. The Spirit of God wants to move for you. You say, Pastor, you don't know where I'm at, but the good thing is you knew where he was at, that you can find him in the presence of his people, and he refuses to leave you like he found you. 
And so the Ark of the Covenant was something that was sacred and set apart. It had been stolen by the Philistines. The Philistines couldn't keep it because it knocked Dagon down like we preached about last Sunday. Then it turned Dagon into a stump because anywhere the presence of God is, the problem cannot stand. God's presence is greater than your problem. God's presence is greater than your anxiety. God's presence is greater than your fear. God's presence is greater than your doubt. Let somebody say amen. That's why the enemy don't want the presence of God in the service. He don't care if we come as long as we don't let God come. But when you begin to understand that church really ain't all that much about you as it is about him. Because if he gets in here, he knows how to fix you. And David was in his place. But David realized that the ark, the Old Testament type and shadow of Jesus, was, was in a tent uh, living in Abinadab's house. And Abinadab had a son named Uzzah. And David got him a board and big wheels. And said, we're going to roll the presence of God back into Israel. Now, y'all going to have to hear me by the Holy Ghost right now. The reason a lot of pastors miss the move of God is they think they're going to get it by a board and some big wheels. If I get the right deacon board, demon board, I mean deacon board, if I get a few big wheels with, with a lot of money in here, then we can have church. Honey, I found out you can have church with a bunch of inmates better than you can church people sometimes because the presence of God is always brought in on the shoulders of the worshipers. And let them that worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. See, the big wheel thinks that God needs him, but the worshiper realizes that he needs God. David came the first time with the boards and the big wheels and it was moving the Ark of the Covenant from Abinadab's house, uh, going to move it to his house. But somewhere along the way, as the anointing was moving, there was a shifting, there was a rocking, there was a shaking. Be careful when you see anointed things in your life shake a little bit. Or you, you'll think it's okay to talk about them. You'll think it's okay to judge them. I'm trying to preach some deeper truth this morning. Sometimes anointed people in your life, they're going to go through some curves that are going to shake a little bit. Don't talk about them. David wouldn't even talk about Saul and continued to call him the Lord's anointed and refused to kill him even in Saul's backslidden condition because David understood to reverence the anointed things of God and that if the anointing had ever been on you, you were to be reverenced, you were to be not, not, not messed with. And David, even though he could have killed Saul, he did not kill Saul because he realized the power of somebody that had once been anointed by God. And now you and I live in church, we live in a time where people leave church and they have the pastor for dinner. Well, I didn't like that singing. I didn't like that preaching. This was too loud. It was too cold. It was too hot. Uh, I've heard that before. Blah, 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 blah. And then your family get in trouble. And you need the church. But your kids have been in the back seat hearing you bash the church for five years. And then when they get in trouble, you need the church to help them. And they say, I don't want nothing to do with the church because all you've ever done is talk about it and make fun of it. You better reverence the house of God. You better call holy the things of God. The house of God is anointed. The word of God is anointed. Your preachers are anointed. And I've seen a lot of people, I've seen the spirit of gossip destroy great things because God would have placed something in somebody that could help them, but because they had heard gossip and they had heard rumors, they couldn't, they couldn't receive from the man or from the woman of God. That's why God hates gossip. That's why it's listed as one of the terrible sins in the book of Proverbs and even in the book of Psalms. God does not want us to have a gossiping spirit. Say amen, somebody. And so David goes to move it. And the problem was when Uzzah saw the ark begin to shake, he had grown up in the house with the ark because his daddy was Abinadab. So to him, he had grown accustomed or grown common with the ark. 
So therefore, when he saw the ark shake, he thought he could just put his hand on it and line it out. Anybody hearing me today? He had got so common and so familiar with the things of God that he took the ark for granted and reached out his hand to line it out. I'm trying to preach right now. If we're not careful, we'll get so common and so familiar with the things of God that we no longer reverence them or call them holy. And, and we just think we can talk about this thing and talk about that thing. But I've come to tell somebody, the devil is a liar. When God has put somebody in your life to bless you, don't talk about about them, pray for them. If you ever see me rocking, if you ever see me shaking, I'm asking you to hold me up in prayer because I promise I will make it through. I might get knocked down, but baby, I'll get back up. <laughs> and Uzzah touched the ark, touched the anointing, and dropped dead. Lord, you better thank God you don't live under the old covenant. I thank God I don't live under the old covenant. Because I've said some things that would have made me. <laughs> I ain't just throwing y'all under the bus. I'm throwing myself under the bus. When I was a young preacher, I thought I knew more than Pastor Jack. I can't believe how idiotic I was. And I would say, well, he should have done this at service. And he should have done that at service. And he should have done this. And. Carlene said, who do you think you are to talk about your pastor like that? And, man, when she did that, it pierced my heart. And I went to Pastor Jack, and I apologized for every time that I ever doubted him or ever questioned him because he was my man of God. And so when Uzzah touched it, somebody say touched it, he dropped dead. And David realized that the presence of God will cost you something. We want the presence of God, but we don't want to sacrifice flesh. We want the presence of God, but we don't want to sacrifice our fleshly desires. And maybe God called you to pray for somebody, but your flesh said, what will they think about me? Maybe God called you to step out and do something, and he was going to use you in the spirit, but you let your flesh... Maybe God wanted you up here with the rest of those women that were up here worshiping, but you let your flesh keep you in the seat, and you missed the blessing that God had for you. In the presence of God, my flesh has to die. There are times God will have me preaching, and my flesh won't want to say what God has for me to say. But I've realized that if the Spirit of God is going to come in fullness, my flesh has to die. I have to become a living sacrifice. And let God be God while he is using me. Say amen, somebody. Is this too heavy for a Sunday morning? For God to move in a Pentecostal church, in a Holy Ghost church, the way he wants to, my, flat, my attitudes have to die. I can't walk in here like this. That's what Papa Troy used to do. I'll never forget when he'd make that face when he's mad at something. You can't walk into the house of God and go, eh, bless me if you can. Let me tell you, I can't. But when you come into the house of God with an humble spirit, when you come into the house of God with the spirit of a worshiper, you are opening up an avenue for the anointing of God to invade your life. When you humble yourself in the presence of God, the Bible said he resisteth the proud, but he will always give grace to the humble. I got anybody in here humble enough today to say I need him today. I need his glory. I need his power. I need his joy. I need his presence in my life. And David said, I don't want the ark of God in my house. I can't believe David said that. Because nobody loved the presence of God like David. But David realized that this particular presence would kill your flesh. See, when you get caught up in the spirit, it begins to kill your flesh. I just got to press on this one. It'll kill my pride. The spirit of God, when he gets all on you, I ain't too proud to hug on somebody that's talked about me now. Because I, I was telling Grayson something about somebody last night, and Grayson needs to pray through this morning. She was, there was somebody that had given me a hard time. And 
Grayson was not praying for him in tongues. I, I can I can promise you that. You don't you don't mess with Grayson's daddy. And I was letting Grayson read the text messages and stuff. I just did that because I wanted Grayson to take up for me. Carlene was gone, so I said, I'm going to let Grayson be in my corner. And then Grayson took it the next step. She said, I'm going to call him. I said, whoa. She said, I'm going to drop a bomb on him. I said, no, 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 no. I had to pull her back in just a little bit. I just wanted a little bit of reaffirmation, but Grayson done got so fired up, she was ready to drop an atomic elbow on him. That has nothing to do with anything, but that's the way we roll at the Absher house. If you mess with one of us, you got to mess with all of us. And I wish the church was the same way, that if you talk about you, baby, you talking about me. If you talk about Myrtle Land, you're talking about me. If you talk about my Aunt Doris, you're talking. David said, I don't want that. It costs too much. And he put it in the house of a pagan. Oh, hear me now. You and I are living in a time that if the church don't want the presence of God, it's going to spill out into the streets and the highways and the hedges and get a hold of people that you would think were unfit and unworthy of the presence of God. They put it in the house of a heathen named Obed-Edom. And Obed-Edom, after three months, he had the best-looking yard in his neighborhood. His house was the most immaculate house in his neighborhood. His daughters were the prettiest girls in the whole school system. You read your Bible. I'm adding a little bit to it, but the Bible said it blessed him and all his household. He got blessed so much that everybody noticed something has changed with Obed-Edom. Something is different with Obed-Edom. And the only thing that was changed was he had allowed the presence of God into his house. I'm trying to bring it into you right now. It ain't just about getting the presence of God in here. It's about letting the presence of God invade your house. I want God to be in your living room. I want God to bless your bedroom. I want God to be with you in the kitchen. See, a lot of the times the reason the presence of God is hindered in his house is because of the hell you're fighting in your house. Because of what you're going through in your house or because of the house you were raised up in. Oh, help me preach this, Holy Ghost. Some of you were raised up in a non-religious house whatsoever, raised up in a house that it was basically paganistic and, and heathenistic. And some of you were raised up in really tight religious houses. And, and what you were raised up in, I don't care how smart you are, how tough you are, what you were raised up with affects you to some degree. We try to act like it don't. It does. Hitler said, give me your children till they're five, and I'll have them for a lifetime. When I was a little bro boy, Brother Ken, we was at that one church, you know the church I'm talking about, and they made us watch a, a, a video on the rapture. And there was this little boy with balloons, and he wouldn't take the mark of the beast. And he had them little three, he had a red balloon. And he had three red balloons. Me and Charlie, we had never talked about this memory. Mom and Dad were there. It was at a banquet. At banquets at the church I went to, you got to watch people get their head chopped off for taking the mark of the beast. And the little boy's mommy was going to take the mark of the beast. And they took the little boy out of her cell block. And he, she was looking through the window of the, of the prison she was in. And all of a sudden, you just heard the guillotine go down. And those three little balloons just started floating up through the air. I was five years old. <laughs> five years old. Me and Charlie never talked about that memory. And one day, me and Charlie... And Carlene and Jill were driving down the road. And he said, BD, he said, do you remember that movie we watched when we was five years old at that award show? And it was about the, it was about the rapture. I said, Charlie, I said, I, he said, do you remember them three balloons? I said, Charlie, I still dream about them three balloons. I mean, they would put the fear of God in you. If I'd wake up in the morning and couldn't find nobody, I knew the rapture had done come and I had missed it. But I was raised up more to, to fear God than to love God. Therefore, when I got in trouble, I didn't run to him. I ran from him. 
And there came a point in my life that I said, there's no way I can go to heaven. I'm going to go to hell, so I might as well have a good time till I get there. Did anybody ever think that? Y'all, y'all. Y'all God's second cousins, y'all never thought that. But I thought, I ain't no way I can make it. But when I came in contact with the presence of God, I found out he was a good God. He was an everlasting father. He was somebody that would embrace and somebody that would pull in. Aren't you glad for the goodness of God that leadeth men to repentance? And David, somebody tells David, they say, David, you remember where you dropped off the ark? He said, oh, yeah, I remember that. He, he killed Uzzah. I don't want nothing to do with that. He said, you remember that old poor boy that you dropped the ark off at his house? He said, yes, I think his name was Obed-Edom. They said, let me tell you about Obed-Edom. Ever since you put the ark of the covenant in his house, his daughters are blessed. His sons are blessed. His wife is blessed. His house is blessed. He's been promoted on his job. Everything the man touches is blessed. Why was everything blessed? Because the presence of God had invaded his house. I'm trying to tell you, don't just get the presence of God in this house. Get the presence of God in your house. God's going to bless your sons and your daughters. He's going to bring them out of addiction. He's going to bring them out of oppression. He's not. Carlina Houston, the tie's got to go. The tie's got to go. It's got to go. It's got to go. Whew. Yeah, she will be watching. <coughs> she better be watching. And so David said, you are joking me. They said, no, king, it is true. Where the presence of God is, there is blessing. Where the presence of God is, there is favor. God wants his presence not just to be in this house to where you get relief once or twice a week, but he wants it to be in your house where your house becomes a sanctuary. Me and Carlene pray that when people come into our house, they feel the peace of God. They feel the presence of God and they feel the joy of God because I don't want to just have God in this house. I need God in my house. Am I talking to anybody? That's why you ought to be able to praise God in your living room the same way you praise him at church. Am I talking to anybody that's ever had to praise to him at three in the morning. The devil was fighting you, but you got up out of that bed and said, God, you are worthy and worthy to be praised. I ain't got to wait till I come to church to praise you. I ain't got to wait till I come to church to get a hold of you. I can get a hold of you right now. I wish somebody get a hold of God right now. I wish somebody would stand to their feet right now and give God some praise. What you respect, you draw to you. What you dishonor, you push from you. If you want to have friends, a man must show himself friendly. I was talking to a guy and he said, I just don't know. Well, I ain't got no friends. And I thought, it's because you're the grouchiest feller I ever met. I wasn't anointed to tell him that, Brother Mike. But it was the God's honest truth. He was... He was so hateful. He couldn't. He couldn't have a friend. He couldn't buy a friend. He just. He couldn't buy a vow. He couldn't be voted off the island. He. He just. But if you're good to people, you draw them to you. If I'm good to Sharon, I will draw her to me. If I'm mean to Sharon, I would push her from me. Do you see what I'm saying? So it is with the Spirit of God. When you begin to honor God and the things of God, you begin to draw His presence deeper and deeper and more and more into your life. But when you begin to treat the presence of God like it don't really matter, like it's something you can take or you can leave, and you you dishonor the presence of God, God begins to resist that. God begins to withdraw from that. There are many churches in America today that at one time they were having a great move of God because they reverenced the 
power and the presence of God. But because they begin to withdraw from knowing how bad they needed him and respecting him, the Wesleyan movement, the, the Methodist movement, John Wesley, he would preach and souls would get saved and sinners would be converted and the presence of God would just fill the sanctuary. But somewhere along the way, many of those denominational churches got away from realizing how bad they need the presence of God and they became a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. Not all of them, I'm not saying that, but there are many churches that have the name Wesleyan or have the name Methodist, but they, you can't feel the power of God there because they, they don't care if God shows up. They just want their deacon board to show up. They just want their mayor to show up. They just want somebody with the big position to show up. i tell you who I want to show up. I want somebody that's hungry for God to be here. I don't care how much money you got in your bank account. How much praise do you have in your lips? How much worship do you have in your heart? And the Bible said that David said, go get that. David went and got the heart. And every six paces, one, two, three, four, five, six, he would kill a lamb, shed blood, give God praise, jump up and down. He stripped down to everything but his ephah. The Bible does not say he was naked. Never take this scripture as, a, as an excuse to strip buck naked and worship in this church. I will tackle you. <laughs> Lord, help us, Jesus. You, you got to explain things to this generation now. You get somebody to strip on down, strip on down, and say, I'm being biblical. No, you're being crazy. He had on a linen ephod. He had on the, 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 the garment of a praiser. And he came into town praising God. And David was a good-looking man. And David, he had muscles. And David had a, had a jealous wife. I understand that. I've read books about people that had that. And she looked at David, and instead of loving him for what used to attract her to him, she judged his praise. And when David came home to bless his house, have you ever had God bless you in this house, and you wanted to go home and take it to your house only to fight devils and only to get in a fight with your wife or your husband, and you think, what happened between point A and point B? He comes home to bless his wife, Michael, and Michael said, well, look at you, stripping down to that linen ephod and praising in front of all those women. She, you were just showing off your body. You were just showing off for the girl. She judged his praise. <coughs> Never judge somebody's praise. Because you don't know what they've been through. You don't know how far God has brought them. You don't know what they're going through right now. Never judge somebody's praise. And David said, if that got on your nerves, woman, this is the Barry Absher unauthorized version. He said, if that got on your nerves, woman, you ain't seen nothing yet. I can praise him a lot more than that. Ah, he was with me when I faced the lion. He was with me when I faced the bear. He was with me when I faced Goliath. I praise God when nobody's looking, so I'm going to praise God when everybody's looking. Hey, the Bible said, that Michael died barren. She never produced a child. She never produced anything. Can I tell you the most barren, as Chelsea begins to play, the most barren people I know in church are the judges. It's not the praisers. It's not people like Cheryl that praise. It's not people like Chelsea and Clifford that praise. Grayson sent me a thing. Why do we always want to cut down trees? that are bearing fruit. Now, you may not agree with everything about Joel Osteen, but you can't tell me God don't use him. You may not agree with everything about Stephen Furtick, but you can't tell me that God don't use him. And if God's hand is on something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to honor it, and I'll pray for him, but I ain't going to talk about him. I ain't never going to use this pulpit to talk about other preachers because if God is using them, I'm keeping my mouth off of them. I'm keeping my hands off of them. Y'all hear what I'm saying? 
Jesus went into Capernaum. He had to go to Capernaum because in Nazareth he couldn't do nothing. Why couldn't Jesus do nothing in Nazareth? Because they didn't honor him. They just saw him as Joseph's boy, as Mary's son, as the carpenter's kid. And the Bible said, the Bible said he could do no mighty miracles there. But when Jesus got to Capernaum, they honored him because they saw him as somebody God was using. And he was so powerful that they would rip the roof off of Peter's house and lower a crippled man down into his presence only to hear Jesus say, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. That got on religious people's nerves. And Jesus said, If that got on your nerves, watch this. He said, I want you to take up your bed and I want you to walk. I want you to notice Jesus never labeled him by his condition in the presence of Jesus this crippled man this paralyzed man Jesus never labeled him by his condition but he called him son if Jake has a problem I got a problem because he's still my son if Grayson has a problem I have a problem but I'm not going to ever label her or him by their problem because that's my daughter that's my son that's my family. And Jesus looked at this man, and he called him son. Can I tell you, in the presence of God, he calls you his child. You've had a bad week. You've, had, you've made some mistakes maybe even this week. In the presence of God, he's saying, my son, my presence is greater than that struggle. My presence is greater than that mistake. My presence is greater than that problem that you are facing. I want everybody to stand to your feet right now because I know what it's like to have the enemy attack my house, the house I live in, and be trying to bring my problems into this house only to have God deal with the problem. God wants to deal with somebody's household problems today. God wants to move in somebody's house. God wants to move in somebody's heart. God wants to move in somebody's life. I want everybody that's fighting battles in your house, in your house, in your family, specific needs. I want you to step out of your seat, and I want you to come to this altar right now while the Spirit of God is moving, while the Spirit of God is flowing in this place. Uh, I, I know there's about 15 people at least that need to be at this altar right now while the Spirit of God is flowing. You need the presence of God to invade. You need the presence of God to overtake. Come on, come on, come on. Give them a hand clap as they come. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. In your house, in your home, what you're dealing with, devils, you're fighting. The presence of God wants to knock down your problems. The presence of God wants to knock down what you're going through. This altar is open, and I want everybody that needs to come, I want you to step out of your seat. And I want you to come to this altar while we're praying and keep a spirit of reverence while we're praying because holy things happen when we begin to pray. Hey, I'm Pastor Barry Absher. I want to thank you guys for liking and subscribing to our channel. All the feedback that we've received has been such a blessing. If you've not subscribed to our channel, I wanted to take this time to personally ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're really excited about what God is doing here at City on a Hill. And we're also excited about what God is doing in your life and in our lives together. Let's be part of the internet family. Let's link up. Let's join. Continue to watch our videos. Like, subscribe. Let's get on the train together and see what happens. God bless you so much. Bye-bye.